Hello everyone, welcome to Leaders Live. It's our monthly chit chat on all the things that matter in the world of sport business. I'm David Cushnan, he's James Emmett, and wherever you're watching, thank you for being there. Today's show is an Olympic special as we discuss the relevance and interest in the greatest show on earth. Yes. We are seeing exceptional performances and a feast of sport in Tokyo achieved and delivered in uniquely challenging circumstances. But beyond that, what kind of future does the Olympic Games have in a rapidly changing world? To help us paint a picture, we'll be joined by three experts from three parts of the Olympic world. Uh, with her International Sports Federation experience, Sarah Lewis, longtime General Secretary of the International Ski Federation, will be with us. For a local organising committee standpoint, Los Angeles 2028 Chief Marketing Officer Amy Gleason will be with us live. And we will have a brand and a National Olympic Federation viewpoint from the former Adidas and Dutch Olympic Committee executive Thomas van Schoen. Shake joining us shortly. Thomas Van Shake providing the two in one option there. Very Absolutely. Good. Um, your contributions are both welcomed and valued too. So get in touch at Leaders Biz on Twitter. David's going to be on Twitter uh, or by commenting live underneath or beside this live feed on LinkedIn. I'm going to be on that one. Get involved. But first, James, just a little bit of time for us to note a few things uh, worth noting from across the global business of sport. Uh, we must start with the Olympics, of course. Of course. Of I'm course. loving it. You're loving it. I'm sure you are uh, as well. Olympic uh, David, Olympic James. Indeed. In the UK, though, a little bit of surprise uh, for many viewers uh, to discover that the BBC, for so long, the Olympic broadcaster, the Olympic broadcaster in the UK, is only allowed to show two live sports rather than everything, as we had become accustomed to in London and Rio and that's because Discovery of course is now the primary UK rights holder as indeed it is across Europe. Yeah it's almost as if people don't pay attention to what's happening in the sports rights market David um, but certainly there's been a bit of a communications vacuum on the BBC side not to inform viewers before the games started that its coverage would be more limited and on the Discovery side not to make more of its extensive rights, particularly as it promotes Discovery Plus over Eurosport. I will tell you this though, what the Olympic Games viewing experience is missing What's is missing? a red zone style, soccer Saturday style, whip around channel, mm -hmm. as I'm calling it, uh, taking viewers live from venue to venue as something exciting, dramatic is uh, happening. Uh, I would certainly sign up for that where it's available and let's hope it is soon. Indeed. Uh, elsewhere, uh, Barstool Sports uh, making its move into live. Something announced earlier this week that is well worth keeping an eye on. Barstool Sports, the in-your-face and often controversial digital publisher acquiring the live rights to a college bowl game. Yes, the Arizona Bowl will now be known as the Barstool Sports Arizona Bowl. Uh, trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. With Barstool taking naming rights and taking over the live coverage, replacing CBS uh, as the broadcaster. And there'll be a strong betting flavour to this as well. Barstool um, owned by a betting firm and heading very much in that direction, as is the state of Arizona as it moves towards legalisation. Yeah, uh, and they're promising to give it the full Barstool treatment in terms of coverage, for better or worse. Bottom line is, it's going to be harder than ever to ignore Barstool's brash take on how to do sports content. Now, another thing that I noticed over the last couple of days that piqued my interest was former President Barack Obama uh, joining NBA Africa, the new entity formed by the NBA as a strategic partner. He's going to be working across the league's social responsibility efforts on the continent. And James, he's put his money where his mouth is uh, because he's taken a minority equity stake in the venture. Yep, um, and it's well worth watching how uh, NBA Africa grows. It primarily includes the Basketball Africa League, a new 12-team competition, as well as having a mandate to grow participation, commercial revenue and fan base. We know from the work of NBA China, again, an entity in its own right, created by the league, that the NBA doesn't do things by half when it comes to internationalisation. Indeed, and it's definitely uh, another hint of the ambition and the, the grand vision uh, that they have for the Africa project, that they've got somebody of the ilk of President Obama involved. And it's definitely a model that other rights holders are going to be taking quite a lot of uh, time to look at um, as they look to Africa as a potential growth region, because, as you said, the, the NBA has form in this area. Um, Right, that was quite a nice whistle-stop tour, wasn't, wasn't it? Wasn't it good? Wasn't yeah. it good? Um, 
It's an Olympic special today and handily our colleagues at Sports Business Journal have a man on the ground in Tokyo reporting on the Games and you of course can find full coverage of all the big business news around the Olympics on the SBJ site. We though asked Chris Smith to give us his assessment of how those lucky enough to make it to Tokyo are viewing the future of the Olympic Games. Here's his dispatch from Tokyo. As recently as a few months ago, it was still unclear whether or not the Tokyo Olympics would actually happen. So it should be little surprise if stakeholders here on the ground in Japan are thrilled. Tokyo organizers have pulled off a Herculean effort to get the games going, and everybody is pumped that we're through the opening ceremony and onto the actual Olympic competition. Among the highlights of this year's Olympics are some of the new sports. We've seen the debuts of skateboarding, of surfing, of three on three basketball. Sport climbing and freestyle BMX are still in the docket to come. The inclusion of these sports is a clear indication that the IOC is trying to target and engage with a younger audience. The strategy seems to be paying some early dividends. In fact, when I was leaving the men's street final on Sunday, I passed a crowd of dozens of Japanese citizens waiting outside the gates just for a chance to see gold medal winner Yuto Horigomi. Paris 2024 is going to feature the same new sports that we're seeing this year, plus the Olympic debut of breakdancing. The sports program has not yet been set for LA 28, but we've already seen that organizing committee have a concerted effort to make sure that those games are hip, youth forward, and culturally relevant. Don't be surprised to see esports in the mix. And it's a safe bet that we're going to see more of the same at the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games, which last week were awarded to Brisbane, Australia. That vote was something of a curiosity here in Japan. The IOC did its best to build tension around that vote, but frankly, there wasn't any. Australia was unopposed, and members of the press had actually received congratulatory press releases hours before the final vote was taken. Still, stakeholders seem pleased with the choice, and some believe this is yet another piece of evidence that the IOC is looking to place the games in major markets where concerns about logistics and challenges are few and far between. And to be sure, coming out of Tokyo and then getting through Beijing within six months, the IOC can use as few headaches as possible. That's SBJ's Chris Smith there reporting from his hotel bedroom in Tokyo. OK, time for today's big question, which is... Who really cares about the Olympics? And why you should. Of course, it's a slightly deliberately provocative question, but even as gold medals are being won and lost and spectacular sport is happening all around us, the future of the Games is, at best, more complicated than it has perhaps ever been. And much of the reason why is a reflection of what's happening in the wider world. Disruptive technology, rapidly changing media habits, a new generation of demanding consumers and historic norms. Traditional organisations being challenged like never before. The International Olympic Committee is facing all of these challenges in the most high profile global way. And yet, across broadcast production, its evolving partnership model and even its new host city selection process, as we were just hearing about, uh, we have an organisation in the IOC that really seems to recognise the need to change to meet the demands of the time, but somehow isn't able to do so as quickly or visibly as many observers or stakeholders might like. And with a younger audience, socially aware, empowered by technology and used to getting what they want when they want it, what are the moves the IOC needs to make to ensure Olympic sports and the Olympic Games adapt and move with the times? Lots to get into uh, with our guests uh, on that. Uh, just by way of context uh, before we get to them, um, let's uh, play in a slide and give you a reminder of uh, recent and future Olympic host cities, uh, with Beijing next up for the Winter Games in February, and then Paris taking over the mantle from Tokyo in 2024. Uh, we'll hear more from Los Angeles 2028 later on. Uh, there's a gap the IOC needs to fill for the Winter Games in 2028 and Brisbane, as we've heard, locked in for 2032. And here is a snapshot of where uh, one area where extensive interest in the Games is being generated, and that is with women. Uh, you're going, here we are, we're going to see some uh, numbers from Nielsen Sports here, looking at female interest levels in the Olympic Games by country. Of particular note, overall interest around the world in the Olympics among women is a full 12 percentage points higher, according to Nielsen Sports, than the aggregate interest in the NBA. 
Looking at that chart, David, are you, are you, are Nielsen telling us that 54% of women in China are interested in the Summer Olympics? Yes, I believe so. It's about 450 million people. It's a people. big old number. The Olympics it turns out is people, popular. People like it. What do you know? Absolutely. Uh, anyway, it's time to discuss all of that and more now with our resident expert who will be with us throughout the show. He's had senior roles at Adidas, at the Dutch Olympic Committee, and now as a consultant at his own firm, The Athlete Brand. It's a warm Leaders Live welcome to Thomas Van Schaik. Thomas, how are you doing and where are you doing it? Uh, I am in Utrecht, the Netherlands, and I'm doing exceptionally well. It's a very sunny and pleasant day, and uh, it was early morning uh, with the time difference of watching the Olympics far, far away. Uh, I think it's very exciting to be here, so it's lovely to see you both again. It's been a while. Yes. Nice to see you, Thomas. Thanks for joining us. Um, Thomas, let's go in hard and go in early. Um, what do you say to those people who think and say that the Olympics is no longer relevant? Well, um, if the United Nations are my structure, Olympism is my religion. And I think that the ideal of the Olympics is as relevant today as it was a thousand years ago, in the sense of we human beings all share driving ambition to be the best we can possibly be. We have a need for human stories. We have a need for human achievement or celebrating human achievement. And the Olympics are a lovely way of uniting an entire planet and doing it together. So I'm a big Olympic fan. Uh, and I think that the ideal is as alive today as it was a thousand years ago. Good stuff, uh, Thomas. As we said, uh, you are sticking with us through the show. And we're going to be coming at, uh, to you at various points for uh, some expert commentary. So stay there and uh, listen in. Uh, let's bring in even more Olympic experience uh, to the conversation. Sarah Lewis was the General Secretary of the International Ski Federation uh, for two decades uh, until last year. Also a presidential candidate uh, this year and now firmly established as one of global sports leaders. And Sarah joins us on the line now. Sarah, very good to see you. How are you? Extremely well, and it's great to be with you all. Thank you. Um, Sarah, same question to you. What's your view, uh, having heard what Thomas said on, on uh, how you would, uh, how you would uh, react to people who said that the Olympic Games is no longer relevant? Well, personally, in addition to uh, the role that I uh, served for 20 years as Secretary General of the International Ski Federation. I myself was an Olympian. I competed in the Games in, in 1988 in Calgary and uh, was at every Winter Games since as a team director, then as a technical official, and then since 2002 uh, as the, the Secretary General. And uh, I can tell you the way that the Games have evolved during that, that period, the emotions that they uh, uh, that they bring out is is just unique actually look the games are the lead item on the main news in most countries when their nation wins a gold medal or in fact for some nations who are not regular medal winners they uh, and, and they capture a best result it's the lead item you you only have to look at the viewing figures the interaction that it causes, and uh, some of the pictures that have gone absolutely completely viral uh, with the emotions of, of family and friends, of medalists, the reactions of the athletes. And it's really all about uh, what the Olympics contributes to, to society. It's much, much, much more than just the period of the Games. And uh, I think we're feeling that uh, perhaps it's even accentuated now because of COVID, because of the pandemic, because of the uh, exciting ways that the games are being broadcast, communicated, shared, the interaction. The Euro 2020 was terrific, but it was a warm up in comparison. Uh, Sarah, there's plenty to get into um, in terms of our, our overall topic today, which is really how the Games is evolving and how it, how it should evolve um, into the, the future. One area that we touched on right at the start of the show was around uh, new sports joining the programme. And obviously, we've got a few of those um, up and running in Tokyo, uh, surfing, uh, for example, skateboarding, which has already uh, produced a, a couple of really, uh, really great global storylines. 
Um, we've got karate coming uh, later in the uh, in the program as well, and, and sport climbing. And obviously on the winter side, and we shouldn't forget um, the, the Winter Olympics uh, in this conversation today, uh, there's been a history uh, in recent times of new sports on the program. What's your view, what's your assessment of uh, the way in which the IOC should continue to strike the balance between adding to the programme and bringing new sports into that Olympic programme versus retaining those uh, sports uh, upon which the Olympics have really been built? Well, that is exactly the challenge. We've seen the, the sports that have made their debut uh, and this is actually the first of the summer games, well, the first of any of the games where the organisers make their proposal for the sports that they would like to have added for their games. And basically they're only added for this edition so that they're relevant and they're appropriate for the host nation when it comes to the interest, when it comes to the strength of their teams and, and so on. So there's no question, you've, as you've alluded to, that it's been a big, big success. And, and it is striking that balance, no question. The traditional sports, as we're watching at the moment, swimming, gymnastics, uh, athletics is coming up. Uh, these are obviously mainstays of, of the program and uh, huge recreational sports as well. And then to combine that with uh, new sports like skateboarding, surfing, sport climbing, mm -hmm. all the sports you mentioned, it's a very, very fine and delicate balance. For the international federations themselves, the majority of them, to be honest, they are where they are because they're on the Olympic program when it comes actually to financing, when it comes to the visibility of the sport. So it's a battle out there to be on the program. And for those who are on it, they absolutely don't want to uh, relinquish that status. And for those who aren't on it, they're battling tooth and nail to, to get onto it. So perhaps the Olympic medal when it comes to the sports themselves, it's even greater to be on the program. But I think this balance is, is excellent. When it comes to Paris 2024, they have uh, proposed to include breakdancing. That was uh, carried out at the Youth Olympic Games in, in, in uh, Buenos Aires um, in 2018. So that's had a successful debut at that level and, and now we'll see it uh, in Paris. And then similarly, uh, uh, Los Angeles will, I'm sure, come up with some very, very appropriate sports uh, for LA and for, for the US. When it comes to the Winter Games, there were no new events proposed by PyeongChang 2018, but um, Milano Cortina 2026 has proposed new events, uh, new sports, and, and it's... Um, ski mountaineering that's going to be on the program. In Beijing, it's only new events that are on the program. There are actually no new new sports themselves, but the new events are going to be exciting, uh, certainly, and uh, they'll be highly anticipated. We've got a little more than six months there. So I think bringing in this touch of having the actual uh, local organizer making the proposal and not only the international federation is very important because we've seen that creating that home enthusiasm, that interest, that passion, even without spectators, it's absolutely crucial. So two gold medals for Japan in skateboarding, a new, new sport, it speaks for itself. It's been a success. Sarah, I guess um, one of the main objectives for Olympic stakeholders in adding sports to the programme is to appeal directly to new audiences and often to to new, younger audiences. As someone who's uh, led an international federation for, uh, for many years and, and have only just come out of that position, we assume you're in a position now to tell it like it is, Sarah. Um, so do you think there is enough knowledge and expertise within uh, executives at international federations on just what young people want and, and, and how they want to consume the Olympics. Did you just remove an Arsenal mug from, uh, from, from Vision there? It was actually my water bottle, but oh, uh, the okay. Arsenal mug. There you go, <laughs> there you go, there you go. Very, yeah. very good, very good. Um, yeah, the question was, do you think there's enough knowledge and expertise within uh, international federation executives 
on what young people want and how they want to consume the Olympics? Well, it's been, I think, one of the main tasks during uh, lockdown, during the last 18 months, no question, uh, to, um, to increase that knowledge. And we've seen lots and lots of good initiatives. And uh, that is the key challenge. Uh, for example, one of the very traditional sports who has a, a, a quite different demographic uh, equestrian sport, uh, FEI, they launched a, a fantastic initiative with TikTok that um, you wouldn't imagine to be uh, very, very important, but it was a huge success for them. So there's uh, initiatives like that that are taking place, basketball uh, have done similar, and partnerships um, really trying to appeal to a young audience has become a very focal point. And uh, social media interaction, it's become actually the main form of communication for the, the, the traditional sports too, and, and for sure there's there's uh, an awful lot going on. But you can't neglect the older audience and especially uh, perhaps the Olympic skeptics because they are huge influencers when it comes to their family uh, and when it comes to their interests as well. Now, perhaps not as much as it used to be because uh, in the past, of course, you know, whatever uh, the parents decided was on the television was on the television. Now, who cares? You follow it on the mobile, follow it at on, on own devices but uh, yes whether or not the actual knowledge is within the federations everyone's reaching out and making sure they get that knowledge and then implementing it definitely right up the the Richter scale when it comes to priorities. Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps an appropriate time to bring um, Thomas Van Schaik uh, back in uh, at this juncture. Uh, Thomas, of course, uh, with his experience at Adidas and the Dutch Olympic Committee, but particularly um, with Adidas. Adidas, obviously, uh, a sportswear brand that is immensely successful at appealing to uh, generations and generations of, of newer and younger audiences. Thomas, I'm interested in your take on this. Do you think the Olympics uh, is adept at appealing to newer, younger audiences. <laughs> well, I think we're struggling with Thomas's audio there. I was trying to behave and mute my mic. <laughs> very <laughs> good, yeah, very good. Always, always misbehave. Uh, and it gave me time to think as well. I would say, uh, I think they're trying very hard. Obviously, the Olympic Channel is a, a very serious investment, and there's an, an incredible number of fantastic storytellers and uh, 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 technical wizards that are doing amazing work as, a, as far as the Olympic Channel is concerned. But I do believe that what you mentioned earlier, like a, a red zone for the premiership or the banter between either Everton and Liverpool or, you know, the sense of fun and rivalry and camaraderie and personality and humor is absolutely critical when it comes to creating a brand personality and a brand identity for the Olympics as well. Mm -hmm. so you cannot always uh, be politically correct, respectful, uh, uh, friendly, and uh, uh, celebrating uh, exceptional physical effort. You know, uh, being consistent does not mean that you're being predictable. If you're being predictable, then why should I listen to you? If every athlete or every IOC official sounds like a politician and says the same thing, then why would I listen anyway if I can already predict the answers? So a sense of personality, I think, is absolutely fundamental because if not, uh, uh, the audience will find ways to, to add their perspective, to add personality, to add humor, to add insight, and maybe even uh, a little bit of provocation. Um, consumers today uh, move seamlessly from live stream here to highlight over there, and, uh, and they, they, they're desperate for an original point of view. And I think that that is one of the points where I believe the Olympics can still add value and find new inspiration. Thomas, the, um, 
the other stakeholder group that we should mention, of course, uh, the uh, Olympic sponsors, Olympic partners, and particularly the top partners operating at that worldwide level. And we've seen an evolution in the type of organization that is um, signing those top agreements um, over the past three or four years or so. Um, Alibaba, Airbnb are two that, that jump out. What's your sense as somebody who's been involved uh, with a big brand, um, but also within the Olympic ecosystem, what's your sense of how those type of um, new style uh, sponsors are assisting the IOC and the Olympic movement, uh, particularly around consumer data and knowledge about consumer habits? Well, I mean, uh, asking the question is answering the question uh, almost in a way. Saying so, uh, clearly, uh, when we look at these new uh, digitally led brands, Google, I think, is also a, a partner of the Olympics in Tokyo. They are empowering fans, consumers, their consumers, to be in the driver's seat. Their recommendation, divine, degrading, their uh, their uh, uh, um, ratings uh, rank. Uh, their entire structure and um, within the Olympic family, the final say is mostly not necessarily with the with the, with the fans themselves. And to have a more consumer centric or fan centric, or dare I say, athlete centric approach, I think is going to be uh, crucial uh, with regards to the next ten years of the IOC. Uh, and we've got plenty of people with us tuning in on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plenty of people saying hello on LinkedIn, as far as I can see uh, at the moment. Uh, a message for Sarah from Heather Bowler, who's tuning in from Tokyo. Heather Bowler with the International Tennis Federation. She says, uh, I agree with you, Sarah. Judging by the players' tears here at the Tokyo 2020 Tennis, whether they win or lose, it's raw emotion and it matters to the athletes. A lot of people also having a discussion on LinkedIn here alongside the stream uh, about where the Olympics should go next. Um, we've got some people tuning in from Africa um, saying they'd love to see an African country hosting the Olympics. Um, someone else uh, chipping in with South Africa, Egypt and Morocco all have the capacity to do that. Whether they do or not, I'm not sure. But I did want to pick up on this strand of conversation and go back to you, Sarah, um, with the uh, question around the host city selection process. We've, we've seen that change a little bit of late with Brisbane being uh, brought in uh, in a different way uh, from how the bidding process has worked before. What's your assessment uh, of that change in the selection process? And is local support for a Games a nice to have or a must have? Local support is absolutely a must-have. There's no question. Uh, we've seen it with uh, uh, actually with every games that there's the the, the skepticism and the, the media really um, emphasising about um, uh, difficulties in host cities and lack of support until the games begin. And now it's just been fantastic to listen to to sports stories to. Uh, to seeing just how much the Japanese public have embraced these games. And uh, many friends that I've got in Japan, we've been interacting. And yeah, it's just changed the spirit of everything in the country uh, now. And of course, their successes has been so important for this. But when it comes actually to the change of procedures, it's a smart move. Um, I was involved with the London 2012 bid, and uh, that was the last really, really big bid uh, in 2005, when uh, the, the last five finalists were New York City, were Madrid, were Paris, were Moscow and London, and uh, that's some pretty big world cities there. And um, the IOC president, Thomas Bach, his view was, we don't want losers, because these cities are not losers. They're all winners. And the first step that was undertaken with LA and with Paris in 2024, uh, for in 2028, and Amy will remember this well, was, well, we want both of them. So let's just find a solution because these are two outstanding sports cities. They both got to be Olympic organizers. But the problem is, is when you have a so-called loser in the vote to get that public support for the next time, that was what was proving the stumbling block. So if you can appoint them both as winners at the same time, and that's what the IOC has done with 2024 and 2028. 
then everyone's happy. And it's a smart process because the investments that the cities are making just into the bid, well, that's all monies that could go into sport, that could go into other areas of society as well, of course. Um, and um, yeah, so it's a wise move. When it comes to games in Africa, it's definitely a vision of the IOC, of the Olympic movement. They assigned the uh, Youth Olympic Games uh, to, uh, to Senegal. Uh, they've been postponed uh, because of the pandemic and uh, uh, this has been sensible, but hopefully that will also give time for the whole situation in Africa to, to evolve and the IOC will support that. You know, we've seen outstanding Rugby World Cups, we've seen the Football World Cup uh, take place there. So the Olympics is the, the, next, uh, the next challenge. Perhaps not the Winter Olympics. No, indeed. Um, Sarah Lewis, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. That's Sarah Lewis, a global sports leader and the former General Secretary of the International Ski Federation. Now, building on what Sarah was saying, uh, we asked our Leaders Live presenting partner, Infront X, to give us a perspective on how international sports federations can maximise the games from a digital audience perspective. Um, I said perspective quite a lot there. Uh, Phil Sharp, Managing Director and COO at Infront X, sent us this answer. Hi, everyone. As I think through how sports federations can maximize their value through digital channels for the Olympic Games, I think in terms of during the games and after the games, and I also think in terms of avid fans and casual fans. Um, as most of your avid fans are usually participants of your sport, their families, their relatives, friends, etc., cetera, um, maybe hundreds of thousands, millions worldwide, hopefully you have an app for them that they're leveraging. Uh, you need to continuously provide updates and teasers on that app. You need to provide in-depth content for those avid fans, and you need to leverage social channels uh, by automatically creating content, including highlights, images, uh, narrative clips, etc., that you distribute through those channels. Your casual fans throughout the games will see those social channels and hopefully be drawn in to watch your televised programming uh, or stream programming. Secondly, after the games, it's important now that you reach out to those casual fans, that you leverage all the free social channels and uh, let's call them standard media channels uh, to distribute the content that you have rights to and interest folks hopefully to change into becoming a more avid fan and watch the next event that you put on for your federation. Uh, hopefully you have OTT channels throughout the year that you're streaming content on that you can pull them to. And as you do that, you can provide more in-depth stories about your participants, your sport, etc. The final piece of advice after you do the Olympics, um, I suggest you overdub the uh, VOD streams uh, with a beginner's narrative where you lay out the rules of your sport and you give some uh, niche commentary on explaining the nuances of your sport to fans. Thanks. I hope that was helpful. Very helpful indeed. Thank you, Phil Sharp from Infront X. Now, this is Leaders Live. This is our Olympic Games special, uh, and it's time to shift ahead seven years to uh, our next experience of the Olympics in the United States. Yes, Los Angeles is primed to host the Summer Olympics for the first time since 1984 and has big, bold ambitions to inspire and enthuse a whole new generation of fans. So let's find out more uh, by speaking to LA 28's Chief Marketing Officer, Amy Gleason, who joins us live now. Amy, it's great to have you with us. Good morning. Thank you for uh, getting up early to be with us. Good morning. It's nice to be with you this morning. Uh, now, uh, as uh, has been hinted at already on the, the show, Los Angeles is, is getting the big build up in the Olympic movement. It's being positioned and, and set up as, a, uh, as, as potentially a change moment for the uh, Olympics. How does that sort of thing sit with you and, and how's that feeling on the ground in L.A. with, with what, seven years to go? Yeah, seven years to go. And, and it was 10 when we started this journey. I think, you know, 
we're really excited to bring the games home to LA. It's going to be our third time hosting the Olympic games and our, and our first time hosting the Paralympic games, um, which we're really excited about as well. Um, you know, LA is, is a city that is really built for this in so many ways. And, uh, you know, a city of creativity, of dynamism, and, and we really look forward to, to welcoming the world. We think there's so much great tradition that we'll build on, but we are excited to bring some freshness um, and some new perspective as we look to really engage that next generation of fans. And I'm interested, uh, you know, obviously a lot of what we've been talking about um, in terms of the way that fans interact with the Olympics is being fueled and driven by uh, changes in technology and the access and um, ability that technology uh, can, can give um, organisers as well as fans in terms of how they consume. Um, seven years out, how are you trying to anticipate how fans will consume uh, sports and the Olympic Games in 2028. And what does that, you know, what does that sort of planning look like when, uh, as we know, the tech world can change pretty quickly? Definitely. It is a, a challenge to really think about, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball to say exactly what the world is going to look like seven years from now, but we continue to lean into, uh, you know, to data, to research, to insights and to understand um, you know, how young fans are interacting with content, um, how they are interacting with sport, um, and what is it that makes sense to them. We, um, you know, we're very mindful of this audience as we brought um, our emblem to life and launched our brand last year um, in September. For us, it was very important to think about, you know, how do we bring forward a new bold brand? Um, how are we going to connect with that next generation of fans? And in so doing, launch the first digital emblem. Um, a dynamic emblem that allows for, for self-expression and co-creation um, and really sort of leaned into this insight around, you know, the younger generation wanting to be able to, to touch, to shape, to, to be part of that creation um, and to have a chance to really express themselves and see themselves um, in the brand and in that moment. Uh, I'm interested in that, uh, that emblem moment, that logo um, moment, uh, Amy. I'm a sucker for an Olympic logo, um, I don't mind admitting. Um, does it, and, and you know, fabulous to sort of um, put the emblem in the hands of um, local creators to do what they will with it. Does it hint at, uh, at other things to come along the line uh, in terms of a, a direction that you want to, to take these games? I mean, co-creation is, is at the heart of what we are doing um, and, and in how we envision bringing these games to life. Um, LA is a city of limitless possibility, and that really was, um, you know, at the heart of how we brought this brand to life. We launched our brand with 26 creators, as you said. You know, we worked with Olympians and Paralympians, entertainers, um, local community leaders, um, as well as artists. And so each each A, as it will, as you were, uh, brought sort of a different story and a different voice to life. Um, as we continue on this journey, yes, we absolutely expect to offer many more stories. Um, again, limitless possibility. Um, and as we continue on this road, you know, and expand what that looks like, both with creative partners and also on the ground in LA. LA, obviously, um, a huge global city, um, cosmopolitan, lots of different types of people with lots of different types of opinions. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say in any kind of city like that, the prospect of hosting an Olympics is going to be met with, you know, excitement over here, indifference over there, maybe downright opposition elsewhere. Um, what's the plan for bringing all of those different types of people and all of those different types of opinions along with you? Is it important to, to be the Olympics for everyone or, or can you just be the Olympics for the people who are excited about it? So, I mean, going back to the bid itself and sort of the work that was done with the city and, and bringing the games home to LA and, and again, bringing the Paralympics for the first time, uh, uh, it was important to us to, to be reflective of our city, of our great city, and make sure that we put forward a bid and an idea that um, reflected the great diversity um, in perspective and experience um, and really that sense of creativity and inclusivity that we want to bring to life with these games. Um, you know, back through the, the bid, we saw some, we saw wide support for, for these plans and we continue to strive to involve the community in all that we are doing of, uh, and we'll continue to 
put sport at the heart of what we do. Uh, we were really pleased to, you know, launch our commitment to use sport in and around the city of LA with a $160 million commitment in partnership with the IOC on the road to, to 28 and really tra- looking to bolster um, access and opportunity for, for the youth across LA to participate in sport. Um, we're continuing to engage the community through, uh, you know, community councils, through youth councils, listening to, you know, how and what they want to see show up on this journey. Um, and we're really excited to kind of co-create on, on the road to 28. Just, uh, just going back to uh, what you were saying about creativity, Amy, um, w- w- I think across the sports industry, we're, we're starting to move in really into the, the era of, of fans as creators. And there's obviously some, uh, some challenges there in, the way that tr- in, in terms of the way that um, rights and, and contracts and, and have traditionally been drawn up and, and protected. I just wonder, as, as a local organising committee, how much freedom and creativity do you feel you have given that necessarily and understandably the IOC is very protective of its brand, is very protective uh, and and has many, many, many guidelines across all sorts of uh, different areas around building an Olympic Games. How does that feel from a a local organising committee uh, point of view and, and, and how can you sort of explore that moving forward over the next few years? I mean, we're very grateful for our partners at the IOC, and, and certainly we collaborate with them quite closely. Um, at the same time, we are looking to push and bring a bold perspective to how we will be delivering both the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 28. Um, I think our brand and, and how we put forward something that sort of broke the mold was a real indicator for the tone that we are going to strike. And the IOC was supportive of that, of that you know, aspiration, that push, and that challenge. And uh, you know, we are really looking to bring that freshness um, and a new perspective here. And, and we'll continue to, to uh, you know, pursue that on our journey here as, as we, we get closer and closer to 28. Let's bring uh, Thomas Van Schaik uh, back in, who's, who's listening in. And, and Thomas, I'd just like to get your view on that that trend we're seeing, particularly as it relates to the Olympics, as that's what we're talking about, of of fans as creators. And obviously there's such a lot of content produced around the Olympic Games, whether it's from broadcasters, from uh, brands, uh, from the IOC itself increasingly. Um, Where do you see uh, fan-created content playing a role in the future of the Olympics in terms of engaging uh, an audience and being part of that, that content mix if you like well yeah the the future of 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 branding is not branding at an audience it's branding together with them and uh, the idea of open sourcing the la uh the la 28 brand i think is an amazing ambition uh it has to be done that way and not only is content going to be created by fans it's also hugely going to be created by athletes there is this element of, uh, of uh, for instance, Simone Biles voicing that uh, uh, she feels more like a thing than she feels like a human, you know, or, or, or due to the circumstances. So this idea of fan-centric and athlete-centric, uh, uh, but also uh, um, 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 locals getting involved in the organization and the hosting of the games, I think is fundamentally important. Uh, I, I know we're critical on time, but uh, what is happening in Paris, together with uh, uh, Professor Yunus, who was just awarded the Olympic laurel, with the idea of social business and local people in Paris actually contributing, participating uh, uh, from a social business point of view in the hosting of the Games, where the people of Paris no longer feel that the Olympics is an event that's being done to their city, but that is being put on together with them, I think is is, is of crucial importance. So there's a, a very wide group of stakeholders that that was more or less passively involved that is going to claim a way more active uh, role in the creation of these games. And I think that's an absolutely uh, a wonderful phenomenon. Once again, thank you to everyone for joining us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. A lot of love for LA28 and the creative approach uh, to branding being shown on LinkedIn. A lot of love for Amy as well. Uh, we've got uh, people, got an amazing brand, Amy, a great way to keep it modern all the way to 2028. Uh, LA transformed the games in 84. It's a great heritage for 28. Good luck. Can't wait. Uh, and then a comment from Johnny Merch, which I think is a, a, quite an insightful one. Uh, Johnny Merch from Red Torch says, what LA is showing 
showing, which international federations also have to show, is a greater degree of creativity to connect with new, audience, new audiences using non-sports competition means, as many people just don't relate to elite, elite sport that easily, which I think is a really good point in this discussion. Amy, I wanted to um, come back to you, if I may, and um, talk to you a little bit about um, the sport that's actually happening now. Tokyo uh, 2020 in 2021 uh, is going on now. I'm not sure what the time zone is like for you over there in LA. I, I imagine quite difficult. Um, but what are you... Um, it's quite difficult for, for any time zone over in LA, isn't it? Um, what do you... What do you um, what are you looking for? Now that you're at uh, an organising committee, um, do you watch the, are you watching the games differently uh, to how you might have watched them before? And what specifically are you looking for in terms of how people are consuming the games, engaging with the games, that's going to inform what you guys do with LA 2028? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I've had a great fortune to be in the movement for many years, um, had been previously worked at a top partner. And so um, I, I am watching these games, though, a little bit differently, as you might imagine, from the OCOG perspective. Um, you know, I have tremendous respect for what all of these athletes have gone through. I mean, what an unprecedented journey and, and what they have gone through, both in terms of the, the physical uh, stress and the mental delays, I can only imagine. Um, and so it's wonderful to see everybody coming together and these athletes having an opportunity to compete. Uh, at the same time, uh, from an organizing perspective, I can only imagine how incredibly challenging this has been for uh, the Tokyo Organizing Committee and, and all that they have, have had to do to ensure the safety um, and the delivery of these games for the athletes is a top priority. Um, but it is interesting to be watching these games from, from California and kind of see what those time zones are like and, and have that true fan experience. And um, it was touched on earlier. I think one of the biggest things we're really paying close attention to is, is the rise of the technology experience, is the, um, the rise of streaming. I mean, here in the U.S., we have Peacock showing, um, you know, huge numbers of how people are engaging and watching the event live. Um, or later, um, tuning into broadcast as well. But I think the message for us is it's really about um, and, and finding a way to connect to fans where they are and providing them the content as they want to receive it. Um, it's less about the destination and more about meeting them where they are. So that for us is something that we've been really leaning in um, and we'll continue to pay close attention as we, as we watch how these games kind of wrap over the next week and a half um, and look forward to the future. Amy, we have uh, run out of time, uh, but it's been really great to get uh, a view from you and LA, and, and we wish you every success over the next uh, few years. And uh, look forward to being with you and, and chatting again as, as uh, the big day uh, looms uh, in seven years' time. So uh, thanks ever so much for being with us. Thank you much. Uh, that's Amy Gleason from LA28. Uh, final thought from you, uh, Thomas Van Shake. Let's bring you uh, back in because uh, I want to uh, give you a quick hypothetical. Exciting news. Uh, you've just been named the next IOC president. Uh, what's going to be your first decision, Thomas? What are you going to do? Pop Super excited. Up, pop yourself back on mute, yeah. maybe, to give <laughs> Yeah, probably, probably that would be a good idea. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that the next decade of sports is going to be awfully athlete centric. And um, um, the importance of the individual athletes, they will want more and deserve more of an active voice. They uh, deserve more active participation. Their role and influence is only going to increase even further. Uh, humans are bigger than highlights. It is. Uh, it takes great people to tell great stories, and uh, the Olympic is absolutely full with them. And I believe that the athletes are uh, the major advantage that the Olympic family has uh, within itself. And I feel that uh, uh, athletes are increasingly building their brands, uh, investing in their, their digital infrastructure. They are building large communities that are incredibly influential. And we are seeing uh, this phenomenon pan out. I mean, if we see uh, um, uh, Logan fighting Mayweather, if we see uh, 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 Cristiano Ronaldo moving cold bottles, if we see Naomi and, and, and Simone Biles prioritizing their mental health, 
over uh, uh, what used to be uh, uh, mandatory elements in their uh, in their in their career, then we're seeing this influence and, and power shift towards the individual athlete. And I think this is where the IOC uh, is making dramatic progress already, but I think needs to focus even more of their attention and investments. This wealth gap that is approaching, uh, that is that is overwhelming in, in international sports, also needs uh, more attention. There's a, a very small number of athletes that's multimillionaires, and they're competing against uh, athletes who have a very, very tough time. Uh, living from paycheck to paycheck. And uh, if we want to offer them a balanced playing field, then uh, addressing the situation of athletes around the planet is is uh, would be uh, one of my priorities as IAC president. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. President. I am on board for the campaign. Um, humans <laughs> are bigger than highlights. That's very nicely put, Thomas. Um, well said. Uh, Thomas Van Shake from The Athlete Brand, thank you very much indeed for being with us as our resident expert throughout the show today, Thomas. And that is our show for today. Um, Lead Us Live is back on the 25th of August. It's a sports tech special, so do uh, look out for that. Also, remember to keep an eye on the Leaders website for all the information on Leaders Week London. It's coming up fast. Uh, and you can check out all the announcements on speakers, uh, on networking, on anything you need to know about, really. Uh, www.leadersinsport.com is your URL. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's it for Leaders Live uh, for today. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of the Olympics, and we will see you again uh, very soon. Bye-bye for now.